tell me about uh, how long you lived in Bolinas. Well, I landed there in 1966 uh, in junior high school in a marine biology study. Yeah. And that uh, happened to be on RCA Beach. Okay. So when I saw 3,000 acres of wires and pole, you just went wild. And this this. Was, uh, and it wasn't power line type stuff. And it made my AM radio act real goofy. Then I knew that was going to be my home. <laughs> That's where you wanted yeah, to be. A big substation outside. And so I came back uh, and knocked on the door in 1966, and they let so me how, in. How, how old were you then? Uh, I was uh, probably 15. Right. Whatever. And they have let you in. Well, why'd they let you in? Well, because I'm good at that. <laughs> so yeah. I got in and it was easier then. Okay. So I got in and uh, so this was it, was our... a, it was a weekend and yeah. Igor, the switchboard operator, you know, came to the door and I had my two, you know, buddies with me and, uh, you know, because we were glomming from the dump and it was really hard to carry all the glom two miles down the beach. Right. So the aim was, was to be able to try to get in. And I wanted to see, you know, what did this stuff come out of? I had all these ideas in my mind, you know, this 3,000 acres of wire was all coming in the one giant, you know, mass inside this building, and you could hear hum a mile away. Right. So I told the guy, well, we're interested in radio and electronics, and, uh, and we want to see your transmitters. So he goes, okay, come. It was a weekend. Right. So he was a friendly guy, and then... Uh, so, Igor was in charge, so he didn't have well, to ask was, anybody. Yeah, well, he's yeah. not in charge, but, but Igor they, was all that was there. He was all that was there. Yeah, he yeah. was all that was there, and, and he didn't care. We were kids. Right. So we weren't a threat, yeah. and, uh, and I knew what I was talking about, and I was, you know, uh, you know forceful about it. Right. I had intent. Yeah. We're, we want to get inside. Yeah. And, uh, I want to see your stuff. Yeah, so at any rate, I'm going to figure one way or another to convince him to let us inside. There's not going to be any backing off. So, exactly. So what did you so see? So at any rate, so we there? get in there, and then, uh, so he won't let us in the rectifier room to begin with, with the giant humming transformers and all that, which is understandable. And uh, so he takes us upstairs, and then uh, one of the transmitters that wasn't being used at the time, he opens it up, you know, and he goes, well, this is what it looks like, and then, uh, you know, and this is it, and then I go, well, I know that. I explained how the inside of the transmitter worked to him. Oh, uh-huh. And yeah. then that opened up the door. Sure. So, at any rate, then we got to get into everything. And afterwards, he gave each of us a big, giant vacuum tube, you know, the right. bad tube bins, so we got to leave with Glom. Wow. And, uh, and we got to so open up the gate, so, you know, our parents... That kind of tube, in. is that even existent no, today? No, no. So know. you can't even buy them on eBay. These, these tubes are gone. Right. Giant things, big bulbs on them like that. Yeah. Some have had like a pound of mercury in them. So, <laughs> so, so I, those, came, those so I came back. Uh, so the idea was then was how to, to trick our parents into wanting to go to Bolinas Beach on the weekends and not other ones. So we could glom and then, you know, at that point we didn't have to pick stuff up out of the dumps. So we were able to get it from the inside. And then you know, I became more and more part of the station until by the time I was senior in high school, I was part of the station. Right. So it was a hell of an effort between my parents and the high school and the, right. so what and was, the administrators what was... of the station. The big conflict was the insurance. Yeah. So we managed to overcome the insurance hurdle, uh, you know, between my chemistry teacher and my parents and the station manager and the station engineer that worked some way around it. And then all of a sudden, at that point, then I had free access to the station. Right. So, what was the RCA station at Bolinas up to then? What were they doing? That was the only way to get a signal overseas. Oh. That was all the business traffic. Right. All the teletypes and you know and all that type of stuff. Yeah. That was it. RCA handled all that. Oh. Between them and Western Union. Right. So Western Union didn't handle any of the radio. So all the Western Union circuits would have to get converted to RCA on the RCA cable, and then they handled. Uh, every island and country in the Pacific had its own antenna. Right. And that's why it was 3,000 acres of it. And, and all, that broadcasting was, all that broadcasting was coming out of Bolinas. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it was, uh, I think, the second or third biggest radio facility on the planet. Right. And I had free run of it. And total glom rights. <laughs> total glom rights. Yeah. That's perfect. So at any rate, I How was... How long were you there then? How many years? 
up until uh, Greenpeace got a hold of it and finally slammed the door in my face. And what year was that? Oh, that was 88 or 89. So, but, you know, I was banned by various administrations and whatever. And so why did Greenpeace fights. shut this place down? What was the problem? Uh, Greenpeace like? is, uh, has syndicated all radio and naval historic operations in the country. And so that way is to make sure that you know, the Navy's not allowed, uh, Tesla's not allowed, things allowed to happen. So that's their, uh, their deal, to suppress all this. Right. They don't want anyone knowing about Tesla or Alex Anderson or, you know, they don't want Navy people having access to their own historic ships to work on them. They don't want the public to have any contact with that type of stuff. So they deliberately sabotage everything and they close it off. And for that station, they ended up tearing the whole thing down. Then. Well, Commonweal, the problem is when I got back out of the Navy, I got an emergency letter, you know, that situation was all screwed up and the station was going out of business. Right. So uh, I quit the Navy. I wasn't really in there. It was getting a little too screwed up. So they let me quit. Right. And they were not allowed to do that. But they let me quit because of uh, the miracles I performed when I was in the Philippines. So it was fine. Okay, you can are those, go. Just as an aside, are those things something you can talk about, what you made happen in the Philippines? Well, I mean, we could go on forever in this stuff. No, just to... Just well, if we keep going on tangents, each one's going to be an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So let's just stick with the... Stick with this tangent. The deal. So the deal. Okay. at any rate, so I got back out, and, uh, and RCA desperately needed me. Uh, so I was supposed to be employed in a matter of weeks while the bureaucrats and the other enemies I'd made in the company by being the high school kid that had all the keys, you know, and the bomb and everything else, uh, we're, we're, fi we're fighting that. And, uh, and then what RCA did at that time was there was a dilemma of what to do with all the old equipment and they didn't want to smash it. Right. So my job was to, uh, was to play the stupid bureaucrats game and dismantle the stuff and move it all and store it. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco Art Commission gave me Pier 3 and Fort Mason as a warehouse right. and did all the trucking for me to preserve this, you know, antique equipment, which really shouldn't have been removed at all. Right. But at any rate, uh, you know, and the bureaucrats tried to, and RCA tried to drag their feet, but the district vice president was behind me. Right. So he had a, an idea and a plan, okay, and I was part of that plan is in order to save the radio part of the RCA business, you know, for one thing, its competition is they needed somebody to help build their satellite deal because that was taking the business away. Right. So I had all the qualifications and licenses for that. And then the other aspect was is to somehow re revitalize the radio business to come up with something that competes with the satellite. So I was right there in the vice president's office with me and my partner, and we had all our paperwork together, you know, the trust and the nonprofit and everything all done so they could safely transfer the equipment, you know, and all the insurance and complications had been handled previously. So, you know, I began I'm funding all this on food stamps and replacing people's circuit breaker boxes once or twice a month. Yeah. And, uh, there's no paycheck coming in for this stuff. Right. And uh, city and county San Francisco is doing the trucking and paying the fuel bills and all that, and that helped a lot in providing take apart. And the equipment cruise. ended up uh, over. So it. Common Wheels showed up, right? And no one knew who they were or where they came from, and somehow they got in there. Uh, what does Common Wheel stand for? What is it? Uh, common Wheel means common wealth. Common wealth. Yeah, okay. it's an uh, old English term. Okay. So it's like uh, you know some kind of collective uh, royalty type situation. Yeah. And who are these people? Rockefeller. These people, rich politicians, or who the are Rockefeller? They? They're, they're of the New York elite. There we are, living yeah. in California. They all making, came. They making all trouble. came. They all came. Uh, Berkeley, California, was their landing zone. Got it. That's they came in there, and then they were processed there, and then they were sent out to uh, their invasion. Their different invasion. ones were set out to take over different agencies and whatever. And Commonweal, you know, thought that station was too nice for me and RCA and everybody else. So they had connived because, you know, Sarnoff and all of them are of that same ilk. Right. So ultimately, they were Sarnoff's offspring. Right. So I was screwed from the inside. So they, and they got in there uh, and with hammers and they hired all the, uh, the druggy kids in the town and the vandals and gave them hammers and axes. And uh, after I left, you know, I wanted to have equipment unbolted and things. All they would do is they would smash everything, the smithereens, and they destroyed everything inside the station in that part of the building, smashed it. Smashed the, you know, faces of the meters in, broke the insulators off of transport, sabotaged everything so nothing could be used, and I came back to a big, giant mess. 
all the PCBs and the mercury and thorium everywhere, you know, and they had these kids, you know, throwing this stuff around and whatever, and they're supposed to be, they came as they were cancer, you know, environmental sensitive, you know, very spiritual people with their little white clothes, you know, and their, their soothing little tones of voice, you know, and the whole, you know, cutting yeah. crafty little swines. Meanwhile, they're slopping PCBs and stuff all and over the place. All over. And mercury all over the place, yeah. Right. So that was the end of the equipment. It was yeah, it was smashed. the end of the equipment. Everything was destroyed in five weeks. Oh my, uh, the, my main RCA guy there, Ivan Nielsen, just broke down in tears. They couldn't figure out how to stop these people in time. There wasn't any way to stop them. Right. We couldn't even figure out how they got in there. Yeah. So no, unfortunately, no. we made a mistake. Jim Bourne and Ivan Nielsen and myself made a mistake, and we realized it later. And then. They didn't get the rest of the station. So, but what they would do is they would deliberately cut wires and, you know, and steel poles and do all this kind of stuff. And this went on for decades. So what equipment were you able to salvage? Anything? No, I lost everything. Okay. Because they also got Fort Mason in San Francisco. And then everything vanished. The whole thing was looted. <laughs> and then Feinstein uh, pulled her stunt in San Francisco and all the rents went up from, uh, industrial rents went up from eight cents a square foot to a dollar a square foot, so I had no room for my own substations anymore. And then the looters, her looters came in and just smashed everything. I got to watch everything, I got to watch my whole operation get destroyed in a matter of like six to eight months. And everything vanished, right? Smirking little swines, you know? Yeah. And then it just kept on going like that, all the way up to present. Well, what happened to your qualifications? You had clear qualifications with uh, that station with RCA. And RCA with died. Name. RCA died then. Yeah. They did. Yeah. So 1986, GE came in and smashed the rest of the equipment. Oh. Uh, you know, hiring Commonweal. Finish it off. Well, Soros. Right. Okay. Right. Sarnoff. All, you know, all the same crowd. Yeah. They. And then I realized that, that somebody wants that station destroyed and that I was the biggest threat to it because I was on the aim of Jim Hepburn, the vice president. I was going to be the new station. In fact, it was learned when the historical resources study was done on the station that RCA actually intended for me to take the entire facility over. Yeah. You know, this is something I pulled off in high school. You know, and in 1980, I reached my dream that Marconi Building was my laboratory. Right. And, uh, you know, for not only electricity, but for Bach organ music, because the thing was the size of a cathedral. Yeah. Had its own substation, and uh, the bureaucrats and Commonweal and everything screwed it all up, and uh, now the building is just a wreck, and everything inside was just, is destroyed, totally destroyed, everything. They just uh, took the locks off the doors and told the vandals to go in and smash everything. All right. So what did you do next? Where'd you... Oh, let's see, 11 years eating out of garbage cans and uh, begging for a place to sleep at night. Right. So I've got uh, somebody's Navy ship to move on to. Okay, so what happened in that project, the Navy ship? Well, I started to rebuild the entire ship. Yeah. It was, it was at Pier 3 in San Francisco. Right. So at any rate, uh, I had a job beforehand uh, working for this rock and roll uh, uh, music uh, production company, you know, all the sound equipment, you know, right. and setting up uh, the stages and setting all that. Up for the bands. So I was building a uh, solar power switchboard, and I made it out of all Navy parts. Right. So uh, it turned out to be that this guy was also a big uh, uh, drug dealer. Right. And Just it what was you uh, garbage. Well, I didn't care. I was yeah. from <laughs> yeah. So um, I didn't like it. Yeah. But uh, I had no car or anything then, so I didn't feel threatened that I was going to take any losses if the guy took a choke. Right. But I didn't like being around it. So at any rate, a couple of guys came that, from San Francisco that were working on this guy's uh, Navy ship that had been converted into a uh, work boat for the Columbia River. Right. And it got worn out there, and so he ended up with it. And uh, he had all these uh, druggies and screwballs on board, so they came to buy their bindle from this guy to get their snipe. So they're coming, they're looking at the switchboard, and we're talking, they go, they go, we got these meters on our ship. And I go, oh, that's great, you know, and kind of this and that, and, and we're talking, and we go, we need somebody, to, they're not working, we need somebody, can you fix them? Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, I can fix them. So I go down there, and, uh, you, know, you know, and here's this whole, you know, 
na beautiful Navy engine room and big switchboards, you know, and all this type of stuff. And I go, wow, man, this is something else. And uh, so, you know, I start working on the switchboard and some of the meters I could fix, some I can't. And they go, well, can you fix this? And then, you know, I'll go, yeah. And then, well, what about this? You know, and then it started off, you know, with I could, I could repair all the pressure gauges and make them read it right again. Right. And then they found out, well, also I can lap all the valves so they don't leak, you know, and repack them and all that kind of stuff. And then I, I you know, had enough uh, theoretical background, you know, that there was one uh, merchant marine engineer there who was very knowledgeable on the subject. And then we combined, you know, with my theoretical capability and his wrenching capability, uh, it just accelerated. And so we rebuilt the entire ship. And then Captain Hughes would give me, you know, come and give me two, uh, two $100 bills at the end of the week, which, you know, for me was riches. Well, yeah, yeah, compared to what you Absolute used to Absolute riches. And he, at that time, I started writing my notes on Steinmetz, and then, uh, and that blew him away because he, Steinmetz was a hero when he was young. You know, he was an old guy, and he went right. to Steinmetz High School in oh, Chicago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so at any rate, he goes, well, I don't care if you work on my ship or not, but I like what you're doing on this, this Steinmetz stuff. I'll just keep giving you money. Nevertheless, and I go, well, I want to work on the ship. So, so uh, the other guy, uh, Steve Leary, and myself, it took us about three or four years, you know, on a budget economy, you know, to clean all the fuel tanks and rebuild the engines, right. you know, and do all this kind of stuff and clean everything up and uh, and get everything back in tip-top shape again. Well, Feinstein was trying to get all the ships out of the the bay, but Hughes was more powerful, uh, so he just defied all of them. Right. You know, he said, you know, I want, you know, you hook to the, to the fire hydrant, you hook to the power, shore power cables, whatever. He goes, you, you hook everything up and you don't worry about these people. We're not putting any meters on it. And he could get away. This is how powerful this guy was. Wow. He was giant, too. And if you fooled with him, you literally would go for a space flight. <laughs> <laughs> Big guy. So, yeah. then the police chief was his bosom buddy. Great. Tennessee. Good. So, so at any rate, when Feinstein was attacking the homeless in San Francisco, right? Uh, you know, he goes, uh, you know, you let me know if you have any problems, and then he put the word out to, to Hennessy that, you know, I don't want anyone screwing with my engineer guy. I don't care, you know, what his clothes look like or where he's living on the street or whatever. You know, you don't bother this guy. You don't mess with him. But anyway, I didn't, you know, I had a space on the ship. So yeah. that's but that's why I finally got off the street. Good. And uh, and started making some money. So at any rate, uh, all the electrolysis currents from BART and Muni and all that, you know, had, and other things had started to eat the bottom of the ship and it hadn't been cleaned in so long, it was dissolving the inside out. So we had to redo the bottom because it was starting to leak. So we went to Richmond Shipyard. Right. And then uh, Feinstein, you know, boarded up Pier 3 afterwards so we couldn't get back. So we go to Richmond and then the... Uh, the owner of the, the shipyard business is also one of the biggest uh, Navy electrical contractors for overhauling submarine motors and right. stuff. So uh, his crew had informed him that when our vessel came sailing in, that Steinmetz was on board. So he came to personally visit me, and then he <laughs> wanted me to attack PG&E. Right. And that's when I made all the lights go out in Richmond. Okay. So at any rate, he never paid me. And then his crew were all drugged up, and then when uh, it came time to pump out the dry dock and set us down on the blocks, uh, they set us down on the, the wrong blocking plan and destroyed the hull of the ship. And all that effort went to waste. Right. Story of Eric Dollard's life. So how'd you make the lights go out in Richmond? By creating this negative wave of electricity. Uh -huh. So I was trying to make the kilowatt, uh, the kilovolt amper hour meter turn backwards. Because this, you know, the guy that owned this company, he was, you know, he was smart, and he had smart people. And, you know, he was getting this anomalies in, in the electrical bill, he damn well knew that those synchronous machines in the compressor plant could be modified, you know, to, to send energy back down the line. Down. That's normally what you do, is you balance it. Right. And they were lagging it, and they weren't balancing it, so I set it to balance, and then the next step was, well, okay, so that meter stopped turning, so now let's go over with the balance, and we go back out to the meter room, and the, the meter's blocked. So what we did is we brought the plant to its full capacity, about 3 million volt amperes reactive, and just jammed it back down the line. <laughs> and then the whole city goes dark. dark. <laughs> Good job. P PG and E knew exactly where to come, and, and Koffler loved this, okay? So yeah. he has me two days later in the PG and E boardroom. 
with the district vice president, you know, and their engineer and all of his managers, and you know, and, and I'm sitting like on one side of the table and engineers on the other, and I just finished my four my symbolic representation of AC paper. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Confer wanted me there, you know, to mathematically define that that meter is supposed to turn backwards. In fact, that's part of the reason why I wrote that paper, was specifically for that project. And at any rate, I turned that PG&E engineer inside out. Yeah. But they pulled their usual deal, but we're not going to let it turn backwards anyway. So, and then Confer never paid me, and then they, uh, they set the ship down on the wrong blocking plan. At least I caught it and managed to stop the pumping, but it warped the hull and all the pipes were askew, and you know, the engines didn't line up with the generators anymore, and it crashed all the things. So we took it up to the uh, Petaluma River and tied up to some eucalyptus trees and just, you know, sustained. Right, right. And, uh, and I told Hughes, you know, I can't, I just can't control any of this anymore, and uh, I was supposed to move to the Integratron. And uh, so at any rate, uh, what Koffler had done in the process, uh, before we moved up to Petaluma, this is how I ended up getting sent to the Integratron, is he had, uh, he didn't pay the bill, the pg &E turned off 12,000 volts. So at any rate, I want my electricity. So at any rate, uh, after knocking the power out, uh, you know, and that whole stunt with pg and &E, they, they knew that I was an engineer. So I, I went to the port and I told them, okay, you know, you help me negotiate with PG&E and I'll inspect all the circuit breakers and go through the whole thing and we'll have them turn the 12,000 volts back on and, and you pay the static bill. And that's exactly what they wanted. This coffer was, was turned out to be, was trying to sabotage the shipyard. Oh. So, uh, for real estate uh, scam. Another one of the stories of my life. See, yeah. there's, there's all these elements, it's all, but they all work in the same direction. They're independent, right. but they all work against me. <laughs> it's either one or yeah, the other yeah. in a contaminated sequence. You get to be the focal but, but point. But I'm the one yeah. that gets to dump the blood in the toilet bowl out of the rear end. At the end of the, deal. <laughs> at the, end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the yeah. day, I'm the one that gets so to do So this moved that. you on to so, the so, Well, well at any rate, happened. so here's what happened. So, so I go, you know, these big giant oil circuit breakers at every substation, so the first thing I have to do is make sure the oil level's right. There's a reason why it shouldn't be, but at any rate, I'm, I'm required, this is what I, this you're supposed to do. You know, I'm not going to cheat. There was no oil in the smoke circuit breakers. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, uh, so I'm looking around more, and what I did at the substation of the compressor plant is they opened the drain valves on the transformer, and PCBs were just globbing into the bay, raw PCBs. Yeah. So at any rate, I knew exactly what to do. I know how to start a fire quick and hot. So at any rate, I go back to the ship, and all ships are required to have this Coast Guard 911 sticker on any overboard discharge, right? Uh, you know, in case of spill or whatever, there's a Coast Guard 911. So I called the Coast Guard 911 and explained exactly what was happening. And uh, it was this, this, the whole thing was like an episode of a science fiction movie. You know, I went to bed and I got up in the morning and uh, looked outside and here is this wall of government officials coming my way. <laughs> <laughs> Navy, you know, Coast Guard, uh, you know, the, the port, uh, the state, everybody, you know, Environmental Protection Agency, were all there to talk to Mr. Dollar. And uh, so I gave them a tour, and they had Koffler there too, and he was squirming up because the big burn was coming, you know. <laughs> yeah. Navy and everybody was yep. in on this one. The port commissioner resigned that day. Okay, and the Navy yeah. was There's no way to, you could explain the, that. The yeah. Navy was getting ready to launch a giant counterattack on Koffler, who's also one of their contractors, and I had the flee. And that's when the aliens from the Integratron showed up and took me away huh. and uh, moved to Southern California. Right. And that's when the second life of Eric Dollard started. At the Integratron. Yeah. yeah. And that was taken away. Oh, all the same stuff, it just repeats. It's endless. Yeah. Up until the most recent. Well. It was just Landers. And then, then Azab. You know, just when I thought I finally, now I can live in peace in the bushes in my car and never be bothered again, this David shows up and uh, lures me into a situation of entrapment until him and his buddy Azab can steal my identity and jettison me and then they can go live their fantasies of glory and their steroidal, uh, you know, body chemistries and uh, just cast me in the gutter. But it didn't work.
<laughs> no, it, it didn't no, work you're this still time. Here. It didn't yeah. work this time. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't leave. They left. They left. Yeah, <laughs> they can make all the noise they want. At any rate, somebody might stop them from making noise at some point. Yeah, but you're moving on. I mean, no one stopped you from thinking or working. So this is why you're focusing on music now. Well, I've always been focused on it, but yeah. it's all that's left. It's all that's left. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that was, that's the same thing with the mathematics. I had yep. no interest in mathematics. All I wanted was giant transformers and sparks, uh -huh. you know, and, and intense radioactive beams and radio waves and, you know, cool and stuff. all that kind yep. of stuff. And, uh, and rooms full of equipment, but when Common Wheel and all that made that go away, then I was eating out of garbage cans, you know, and then Philo Farnsworth said, okay, well now you're going to go to mathematics. And it was great. I could do all the same stuff, but I could do it in symbols and notebooks. Right. And it was a, a fortunate event because then I've got the theoretical background where then I could really start getting somewhere where before I didn't know. Right. Um, well, what you're doing now is applying an engineering theoretical background to music. And that, yeah. hasn't, that hasn't been done. That hasn't been done in over 300 years. Or maybe so, thousands. Maybe thousands of years. <laughs> it hasn't been done effectively in no. thousands of years. No. 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 It's clearly not. Right. So fortunately, government agencies have no interest at all in music. So you're safe. Well, the government, we government <laughs> we agencies don't. are not my problem. Yeah. Right now, government agencies are my friend, and they have always have been my friend, until they're forced by the assholes to do something. I don't have a problem with the government. I have a problem with this political racist. There you go. That's where yeah. the problem is. Yeah. The, those are the people yeah. doing the destruction. Yeah, that, and now they're joining forces through killery. <laughs> killery. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> We've learned a lot from you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, gen, the the new uh, your new train of thought regarding music it begins with the Pythagorean theories on music. Is that well, it's correct? just like when I get involved with anything, I go right back to the beginning. Okay. Where did it come from, and why is it the way it is? Right. So it turns out to be Pythagoras is the place to start. Okay. And his scale of five notes or scale of seven notes? Well, his number system. His number it's system. Not music yet. Okay. Is those key numbers and how to turn those key numbers into the musical scale. Right. And then the musical scale is not the same musical scale as used today. Right. It's not the tempered scale at all. It's a different geometry. Is that? Is it geometry? Different ratios. Different ratios. Yeah. It has right. different proportionalities or intervals, as people would call it. Yeah. And the intervals are a geometrical progression. Is that correct? Well, they're based on his number series. His number it's series. Nu it's numerological. Okay. It's, it starts off as, it, from a numerological standpoint. Right. And then those key numerals uh, form proportions in relation to each other, which are known as the intervals or the ratios. Right. Are those proportions also based on physical properties of sound waves? Yeah. Yeah. They're based exactly. on uh, principles of, of harmonics and, and divisions of frequencies. And the equal tempered scale is not based on on, on those. No, it's not, not based it's, it's not, not based on, on numbers, it's based on an uh, exponent. Right. Exponential series. So it's based on, on uh on one to the no two to the to the one twelfth power. Right. In other words, the twelfth root of two. Okay. That's the equal tempered scale. So there's 12 roots because it's a 12 order equation, so that gives you 12 notes. And the problem we have, uh, the problem that musically that you have with that is that the overtones generated from those uh, equal tempered notes, the overtones get all jumbled. They don't uh, link up with each other the way they would do in a Pythagorean scale. Well, the Pythagorean has the same problem. Yeah. That was the reason for going to equal temperament. But the only problem with equal temperament is, is there's no longer any phase correlation. Right. So none of the, uh, the ratios are stable. Okay. They have a third frequency that's very low, which is like a dissonance beat. Okay. So uh, the musical form in space is not fixed now. It vibrates. Right. It's like it's out of balance. So it's like having a vibrating drive shaft or something. The drive shaft's turning, you know, at, at the speed make the wheels go, but it's also vibrating like oh. this in another frequency. Yeah. So it's not stable anymore. So if you have like an interval of a fifth and you're looking at it on an oscilloscope, it sits there. If you change the phase, it's the same thing, but it's like, you know, it just changes its position in space. But with equal temperament, it's going like this all the time. Ah, it's a constant right. agitation. Right. 
It's not stable. Because of the third tone that's being created? Is that no, because it's, there's no frequency. The ratio is off. The ratio is off. Yeah. Right. So in a Pythagorean uh, tone, the ratio would be balanced. Yeah, it's right. fixed. It's yeah. fixed. So from Pe Pythagoras, uh, where did you move musically then? Was it to the, the other modes, like the, the Dorian mode, Phrygian mode? Well, that's what I'm studying now. That's what you're Because that's indeterminate. On. Right. So what, what those things are called now are not what they were then. Right. So that's what I'm figuring what out. What is the name of that table you showed me, that, that complicated drawing? Uh, Landoma, oh, or, yeah, or the one that I made? The, the Landoma. Is yeah, the, the Landoma. That, that gives from. all the inter interval. Well, what I started from was just those numbers. The numbers. Yeah. Pythagoras numbers. Yeah, the Pythagoras numbers. Right. Unfortunately, that figure's missing from the book. Yeah. But there's like, you know, one of these ancient, you know, drawings, you know, woodcut type things of, you know, somebody ringing bells, and each bell has one of those numbers on it. Right. The Pythagorean numbers. Uh, you know, the 4 and the 6 and the 8 and the 9 and the 12 and the 16. So s some of these... So old... any of those numbers with relation to any other number gives you a, a, a musical position. Yes. Yeah. Fifth, fourth, or octave or those type of things gives you a position. And then those positions have locations on the keyboard or the musical scale. Yeah. But not all of them. Yeah, and they're, they're tuned completely differently than you'd see the then you would hear the scale on the piano. Right. The piano is equal tempered. And then these types of scales, an E will be a little sharper or a little flatter uh, if it's really going to lock up with the harmonics. Uh, yeah. The, the physical properties of the harmonics. So some of the old woodcuts you were talking about, you mentioned Robert Flood, didn't you? Is that somebody? Well, that's Flood and Kepler. That Flood was, and Kepler. Yeah, that right. was the revival of all this. And, you know, because polyphony had come to being and, and the religious symbolisms were more uh, developed and what have you, is, is Kepler uh, went the science route right. and, uh, Flood, and Flood went, went the religious route. He went the metaphysical route. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, and they couldn't cooperate, but that's the whole problem. You see, this thing is constantly split. That's what has to be corrected. It's like this disparity between Plato and Aristotle. Right. It's gone on and on and on, where now science is split into an opposite, and it's not supposed to, all supposed to be together. Yeah. Music and science are the same thing, they're not separate. Exactly. They were all invented by Pythagoras, and they weren't designed to be separate. They're all part of one thing. So the church and the science and the, all that, it was a big split, but nevertheless, between the two of them, then you got the whole picture. So Flood, Flood uh, dealt directly with Verser symbolism, where uh, Kepler uh, dealt with geometric forms. Right. Kepler dealt with it geometrically more than, than Flood just did it with symbols. Yeah. But it was still based on music, and it still made musical sounds. Right. It was uh, based on the monochord and other you know, physical instrumentation. And his his systems of notation and all that. So where? So I, I I don't have any material on it yet, other than what I got out that book. So that's another thing I got to study. Yeah. So you know I'm not I'm not in a position to speak with authority on any of this stuff right now. Sure. <laughs> well, the fact that you're bringing it up at all is is amazing because it it hasn't been discussed since the time of Kepler. And well, other than this group in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. They're discussing it. Rudolf Steiner is discussing it. Somebody's discussing it, but not here. Not here. No, uh, not it's here. It's just you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks. Well, maybe at this day and age it is only me. Because all those people yeah. now are old and dead. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> maybe it is. I had no idea that anyone else was even interested in this stuff. Yeah. I thought it was I like everything really... else, that I just basically write this so I have something to do, and I can just throw <laughs> it in the garbage can as well as try to put it on the air. No, I think uh, people interested in early music and early music performance will be very interested because this prevent, presents a scientific uh, mathematical basis for what they've known all along. Right. That the, well, that the equal tempered scale just doesn't sound right, and this is why it doesn't sound right. Right. So, so you've got an audience with the early music community. Well, it seems that way. It seems to me whenever I give a, a talk on that kind of subject, like that power of music one, people, you know, are more in tune with that than when I'm talking about other stuff. Yeah. So even if no one's thinking about it, they're making them think about it, identifying it, and they like the idea. Yeah. So there's a yeah. desire for it. And the good thing is it won't get you into trouble. 
Uh, I don't see how it could. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, this modernistic element wants to destroy that way of thinking. Even if it's if, if you, I, I've already experienced this with the invaders of San Francisco, because I've been into this for a long time. This isn't something recent. Yeah. Because I, I studied uh, music in college for two years, you know, if, and I have every note of Bach's music memorized. Right. Because I listened to all of it thousands of times with full, yeah. you know, concentration and meditation. Right. And uh, when I would ever say the harmonic the statement, the harmonic laws of the universe, yeah. uh, the people would go into convulsive reaction in that statement. <laughs> So there could be more opposition to this than anything I've ever done before. <laughs> well, <laughs> it'd be by the same people. By the same people. Same people, whose aim is to destroy any evidence of this. They want their chaotic, relativistic universe. That's it. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. That's all you get in this life is the relativistic universe. Yep. Yeah. And you're a piece of shit, and you have no place in it. Yep. Yeah. Other than pay. <laughs> yeah, we want your money. Yeah. You pay, and then you die. <laughs> and then you die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some statement that some character gave on a movie I was watching. Some old, you know, bag lady that, you know, just before she got murdered, she made some statement. You know, the only thing there is to do is, is work, pay, and die. <laughs> That's all you're required. <laughs> What's that phrase? It's free with your paid subscription. It's free with your paid subscription. So order now. But remember, certain restrictions apply. Certain restrictions apply. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and God is only available on Thursdays. I, I read that on a sign down the street. Here. Oh, yeah. Well, Saturday, I thought. But <laughs> yeah. now is it Thursday, too? Yeah, yeah it's Thursday. <laughs> oh, okay. Just Thursday. Hit that God. There's so many of them. Okay. So would you say there's a spiritual aspect to music? Well, that seems to be the main focus on all the books, is it's a spiritual symbolism. That's how it's portrayed. In other words, it's, it symbolizes very spiritual, various spiritual elements. But I can't speak on authority in that matter. Now, you told us about that impulse wave you get with the course when the waves come together and get that sharp... Oh, right, the instantaneous it, transient. Yeah, could a, could a single person achieve that, or does that take a... No, that has to be a... a uh, the more the merrier situation, mm -hmm. right? It has to be. The uh, more harmonics, the skinnier it gets. Yeah. Okay. So finally, it's that tiny little harmonic, you know, that little 3,033rd harmonic, tiny little, you know, one is the final one that just brings it into the the deal. They all work their part, but it's oddly enough, the tinier ones are actually doing more than the bigger fundamental ones, wow. because they're the ones that fill in the last little gap. What would you recommend to the audience to do at home to benefit from music? Listen to it. What kinds of music should they listen to? Anything from Bach beforehand. Okay. So what, what I used to do at Landers is I would sit in between the speakers. And, <laughs> and, and crank it up. Yeah, and feel the, uh, because it makes geometrical patterns in space. Like in those big cathedrals, the organ concerts. Yeah. It makes whole geometries in space. You can't see, but you can feel these little ball bearings moving through your body and stuff. Yeah. And it actually, it's, it is like, you know, shooting stuff through your body. You can feel it. Yeah. Solid. You so can you feel these things move through your body. So, you listen, so, what so you with that, so I'd sit in between the speakers. And listen to Bach organ music? Well, feel or? the music. Yeah, yeah. What, feel it. Uh, yeah, what music were you listening? Bach organ music? Bach choral music? Uh, the organ music is what impacts the body because of the low frequencies. Right. And, and the harmonic additions because the organ's the analog computer. Yeah. So you can get each equal temperament screws it up. But the pipes are going to tend to lock through the manifold because they're all co oscillators on a common air supply. And what you can do is you can you know, get each pipe for each harmonic, and that's how you can produce those waveforms I was talking about. But equal temperament will complicate that that situation. Right. But like I say, is that is the organ or even a string instrument, two strings going at once, one will try to lock the other if there's a harmonic relationship, and they'll pull themselves into phase. And that's that's, that's how I kept my space diversity uh, uh, receivers in phase because I didn't have a common oscillator. So what I did is I hooked the two oscillators together so they grab on each other. So when you're tuning, you don't get an even sweep. It tunes to a certain, then there's a lock-in range, then it snaps in, and then all of a sudden, you know, the frequencies aren't tempered anymore. They're 
they're fixed. They pull themselves together, right? One depending upon you know which one's going to yield more than the other, and get them to lock in. And we're li when you're listening to music, that's what's happening when you have three different voices and they're they lock into a harmony with each other in the overtones. Right. And you get, that's then you get, you get these get, uh, get exotic waveforms. Right. Yeah. So to get a, an infinitesimal spike lap, that would probably take 100 harmonics. In other words, you'd have to have, you know, almost more strings or pipes or singers than just fittable. And, it's, you know, the person yeah. at the top would be screaming like a gnat and the person at the bottom would be bellowing like an elephant. <laughs> right. Then you could get, you know, the full, full range. You know, megavolt reality. But nevertheless, from what I've watched on my instrumentation, these choral singers get phase unisons in their voices that cause, you know, the amplifier to just start whacking up massive quantities of power. Right. So, you know, the human voice doesn't have that kind of power until they phase. And there seems to be almost more coming out than's going in. Yeah. Strange. And that's that's just the effect of choral music. Without also, you could you could move the position the resultant position and then move the music around inside the cathedral by varying the phases too. Oh. It determines its position in space. Right. Because you have directivity patterns. So if you have two frequencies identical to each other and they're in phase, then it wants to go this way, but if they're out of phase, it wants to go this way. So you can maneuver the phases and you can steer the sound around. That's how my space stereo thing works. Oh. That's why the instrument no longer is in between the speakers, but floats around in the room. You can move its position in the room. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know a telegraph operator that's built some kind of network that does that. So he's only got one receiver, but the way he demodulates it is every pitch. In other words, you have one guy's key is on, you know, like one pitch, the other one's on another because they're all spread across the band. It yeah. jumbles it up, makes it hard to understand because you're hearing all these different telegraph signals going. Is either use a filter and pick one out, or when he has this other network arranged where each pitch now has is a different place in the room. So so he can focus on the one that he wants to listen to and he can turn the dial and move them all around. Oh. So this is a, one of these radio geniuses uh, from yesteryear that's still alive. Some guys uh, we talk of when I have a way to transmit, we talk on the telegraph for hours. So what part of the world is he in? San Diego. Uh -huh. He's a retired uh, you know, aerospace electronics engineer. Smart, yeah. really smart guy. Builds all his own stuff, wouldn't have it any other way. Designs all his own stuff. And uh, we actually didn't get off to a good start. So, and, uh, <laughs> but a genius. Well, he didn't like the sound of my, pre my PRC 47 because it emits more than one pitch. It emits an overtone series. Yeah. And he's going, well, the FCC says that's illegal. I'll never go, well, what's illegal anymore? Don't worry about my overtone series. <laughs> you know, oh, you're using that or whatever. I go, well, I'm in my bandwidth. You can hear me okay. You tune the signal on right. I go, the Marine Corps built the radio deliberately to do that. Oh. He said, oh, no, there's something wrong with your radio. I go, there's nothing wrong with my radio. You know, the, the Collins radio and the top electronics people of the world did not make this radio sound that way because they're idiots. You know, and we got in a big argument over the thing. Oh, boy. And uh, until I told him, well, tune into the frequency that I'm transmitting. And uh, he tunes into the frequency that I'm transmitting and not randomly, and all the overtones lock and he gets a pure tone. And I go, see, now you're listening to it right. And because it's an overtone series, when you get selective fading, if one note gets faded out, you still have the others, and that's why the Marine Corps did it. So if they're in a weak signal environment and fading, you can still hear the telegraph signal. And he goes, oh, wow, well, okay, well, this guy's not an idiot. He understood everything, of course. Yeah. And then we became the best of buddies. <laughs> <laughs> But there's not too many people that can pound on a hand telegraph key at 25 words a minute for two hours. No. And make it sound like a one, one key, you know, Bach organ piece. It's all the 64 notes, fourth notes are perfect. There's nobody can do that by hand. But I can. Uh -huh. so they have to use these, what they call a bug, which is the device that's got a vibrator in it because they can't make their little dots even. Yeah. But a keyboard player can. Sure. You know, if you've got a string of 30 second notes, well, they damn well better be even. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So all the dots and dashes, I can make them sing just like organ music. And the telegraphists love it. You know, and they can't understand how I can do it. But I have my ways. And I can blaze. And this guy, you know, he can come back faster. Wow. And he can keep going. He's not like one of these people, you know, that after the first 30 seconds, oh, well, the wife's calling, bye-bye. You know, 
he gets he gets enraged anytime he gets with one of those people. Why did you get on the air to begin with? You know, you're working him over. You know, you piece of this and that. You know, and what's wrong with you? You what's know, wrong with another you? one of you called the X Y L Q S Q S uh, Q R T. That's a telegraph abbreviation for X Y L Q R T. <laughs> <laughs> You spend a lot of time communicating this way? <laughs> Hours. Hours. Daily. Yeah. That's why Flanders Station was famous because I have the KPH call letters. Yeah. From Bolinas. Oh. Right. N6 KPH. And I'm the only one that knows about that station. And uh, Greenpeace has a fraudulent uh, K6 KPH. They didn't get the station call letters KPH directly. Uh, someone else stole the call letters and then went out of business with them. But uh, they're fraud. They all they do with the station is transmit Greenpeace global warming propaganda and uh, self-edify themselves. And then uh, then people get confused that don't know, well, there's N6KPH and there's, K and there's K6KPH, and they go, you this and that, and I go, no, I'm the real RCA. And mm -hmm. then I give them the whole story, and then I, t I became famous. You know, that, and with that transmitter and antenna system I had there, they could hear me loud and clear all the way in Japan and New York City, all yeah. over. Yeah. And I, I started, I built the automated telegraph, so it was transmitting all the earthquake and weather information. Right. It would, I had a computer and it would just push the start button, and then I'd listen to my car thousands of miles away, and I'd get my own data out of my own station. I was getting, you know, letters from people in Japan, you know, that we're picking up my earthquake reports and, you right. know, the, this advanced seismic warning information and bye-bye, it all went away. I ended up seeing my own shit for sale on eBay. Nothing I could do about it. Why do I want to bite? <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you want to bite? <laughs> <laughs> no frustration there. No, none at all. Oh, Just walk away from it. Pretty and then, much. on top of it, you know, have my pet coyote uh, swindled out of me and my car sabotaged. Yeah. Just to finish it off, you know? Yeah. So is this... See, is that Eric? This was a shit. This was a coyote that liked Thomas Tallis, right? Was it, was oh, one name? of them. One of them? Yeah. Right? yeah. One particular piece. Yeah. <laughs> one I piece. That. I love that a coyote would like a medieval yeah, Renaissance when, when choral I, music. When I went and, you know, that extensive late night music listening and... Uh, you know, the dog would be outside normally because that's what it likes to do. And uh, but when that one piece of music, that one you know piece of uh, of a liturgical uh, choral music came on, the dog would come inside and would lay down on its mat underneath the earth stereo receiver and close its eyes and wag its tail. And then when the music was over, it'd jump up and go back outside. <laughs> and then one day it came in. There's certain pieces of Bach it liked. It laid in this little spot, and did its thing, and it sang one measure of the music in oh, two. Oh, well, that's beautiful. So then I realized I made the mistake when it was young, not realizing that coyotes can talk and sing, was to teach it to sing. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Because we, we could communicate that way, but I never realized that the dog was smart enough to quantify the frequencies into a scale. Yeah. But when it heard it, it could, it could duplicate it. Yeah. I was blown away. Well, sure. <laughs> it was listening and just giving it right back. I'll, yeah, right. I can sing that tune, is yeah. what it was saying. <laughs> the coyote that sings Bach. The coyote that sings Bach. <laughs> that's, that's the reason why the dog, all this, that's the reason why the dog had to be taken away from me. Because it wasn't normal. It was considered because I fed the coyote its natural diet and wasn't feeding it Alpo preformed puppy poop. I was abusing the animal and had to be taken from it. You know, that howly mind state. That's why I hate howlies, you know? Yeah. Just like, you know, oh, gee, you didn't get your vaccination. <laughs> You're a threat to society, <laughs> you know? They're little worms, the little mind worm viruses that crawl around in their heads and make them do all these strange things. Their howlies are really strange people. There's lots of them. Yeah, millions. <laughs> Breeding like rats. <laughs> Every day. Every day, in every way. Yeah. <laughs> I'll become happier and happier. Yeah.